Welcome back, everybody. Our final presentation this evening regards swimmers' health, doctors working with swimmers. The segment will be broken into two 30-minute presentations. First, by Professor David Gerard, sports physician, vice president of FINA Sports Medicine Committee. And secondly, by Dr. Kevin Boyd, sports ortho orthopedic surgeon and honorary secretary of FINA Sports Medicine Committee. Swimmers Health, doctors working with swimmers, please welcome Professor David Gerard. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the organizers for allowing um, some intrusion by the medical fraternity uh, this has taken four conventions to, uh, to achieve, and we're delighted, representing the FINA Sports Medicine Committee, to give you some explanation as to what our role is in the complex of the FINA family. So thank you for inviting us. This afternoon, I'd, I'd like to make several broad statements because the topic of aquatic sports medicine cannot be covered in an hour. I'm sharing the podium with my colleague Dr. Kevin Boyd, but my role will be to discuss with you how FINA has adopted an approach to sports medicine, what aquatic sports medicine involves, I want to discuss a few common clinical conditions that will be of relevance to coaches and, of course, team physicians. I want to introduce briefly the topic of therapeutic use exemption, and I want to finish with a clinical scenario and hopefully get a little bit of interaction from the audience. The FINA Sports Medicine Committee comprises this group my colleagues represent a range of medical specialties, including cardiology, orthopedic medicine, uh, sports medicine in its entirety, internal medicine, obstetrics and gynecology, and family practice. We're all, like many of you, volunteers, and the focus of our attention, of course, are the athletes. Many of my colleagues are here in the audience today and I hope that they will make themselves known to you either during the convention or during the World Championships. The mission statement of the Sports Medicine Committee is very, very simple. We're here to protect and promote physical and psychological health in the spectrum of athletes that are covered within FINA, from the very young to the master's athletes. We have specific terms of reference and we are obligated to be mindful of our need to provide expert advice to FINA to discuss injury prevention, which of course is a, is a career limiting factor for many, many swimmers, to talk about education in health, to set particular medical standards for various events held internationally, to support and endorse research, to promote, of course, drug-free sport in collaboration with our colleagues on the Doping Control Review Board, and to collaborate with colleagues in other international federations in the medical aspects of sport. So aquatic sports medicine is a whole spectrum of clinical challenges. And clearly, as I mentioned earlier, we don't have time to give due justice to all these aspects. We consider the athlete to be our patient. And we consider the patient as an athlete in exactly the same way as we would care for any patient. But we are bound by some restrictions that are placed upon us, particularly as it, results, as it relates, I should say, to the World Anti-Doping Code, and more about that later. We understand as sports physicians the demands of high performance sport. We know about the physical, 
and the psychological stressors that high performance sport invoke. We're concerned about the growth and development of young minds and bodies. We offer advice and bring in experts who might provide us with the answers to nutritional requirements in sport. We are there to advocate for the athletes and advocacy encourages everybody to demonstrate their responsibility to the centre of our focus, the athlete. We are also responsible for considering the implications of sports medicine as it relates to the entourage surrounding the athlete, the coach, the parents of the athlete, and other third parties including sponsors. And then an often forgotten issue in aquatic sports medicine is preparing that athlete for life after sport. There are a number of medical consideration, each, each one of which uh, deserves a, a talk and a lecture in its own right. I've listed some of them here. I'm not going to say anything about musculoskeletal trauma because that's the domain of, of Dr. Boyd. I'm going to say something about asthma, ADHD, infectious mononucleosis, and a little bit about anemia. But there are other conditions that are met with commonly in sports medicine, and in particular aquatic sports medicine, that will need to be discussed in another environment on another day. Underpinning my presentation today, and if there is a take-home message for the coaches, it's that the coach and the doctor must share a relationship which acknowledges absolute engagement, respect for each other's discipline, and the maintenance of autonomy. The coach coaches and the doctor practices medicine. The coach must never assume the role of doctor and the doctor must stay outside of the coaching <coughs> boundaries. And I think that's an important point to focus on because at the end of the day, our goals are to do the best for the athlete and we can only achieve that through our independence and autonomy. So let's pick a few of these clinical conditions and say something about them because as coaches, you'll be well aware that with respect to asthma, we have a, uh, a prevalence in our sport of asthma that seems to exceed many other sports. Why that is, we're not quite sure. There have been attempts to determine why so many swimmers seem to suffer from asthma. And one of the answers to this, I think, is that swimming is often considered for a young asthmatic to be one of the least provocative forms of exercise. An asthmatic may become symptomatic when he or she runs in cold weather, and yet those symptoms are not demonstrated when the same athlete swims. And there are a number of reasons for this, including the, the, the breathing of humidified air, the warmth, and various other factors. Asthma, as many of you know, will know, has a familial trend. And it's often linked with hypersensitivity. Many young asthmatics will also suffer from hay fever or seasonal rhinitis. They may suffer from uh, dermatitis. And these are all a manifestation of what we call hypersensitivity. But with asthma, the hypersensitivity affects the airways. And the smooth muscle within the airways themselves goes into spasm and causes a restriction to breathing, but only in exhalation. Asthmatics can inhale, the air becomes trapped, and typically the asthmatic has a barrel chest, a hyperinflated chest. Of course, to diagnose asthma requires a number of tests, but there are very clear diagnostic criteria involving respiratory function tests, sometimes blood tests, but at the end of the day, respiratory physicians have a very clear list of indicators for what constitutes clinical asthma. We also understand that asthma is provoked 
by a number of things, including exercise and cold temperatures. It might be exacerbated by uh, dust, pollen, there's a seasonal element to it, uh, exposure to animal, um, animal fur, animal hair, a number of other things that may provoke asthma in a young person with the hypersensitivity. Just as there are established diagnostic criteria, there are also well-established effective treatments for asthma. Usually the inhalation of drugs that relieve the spasm in the smooth muscle and open up the airways, and other drugs which are used as preventers that reduce the inflammation and provide a background to asthma symptoms. Reliever drugs and preventer drugs, some of which are on the banned list. And I'll talk more about that in terms of therapeutic use exemption. A little bit about ADHD. Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is a neurobehavioral disorder which is well documented and occurs internationally in an incidence of between 3 to 5% in, in most populations. There's a characteristic history, a pattern of inattentiveness with hyperactivity, impulsivity as part of the spectrum of behavior. Once again, there are internationally agreed diagnostic criteria which must be met to diagnose ADHD. And it's very important to consider these diagnostic criteria before commencing an athlete on the appropriate therapy. Because the appropriate therapy again involves the use of prohibited substances. Along with medication, there are behavioral modalities that are sometimes used in the management of ADHD. And it's quite frequent that athletes will find that participation in sport, involvement in training, regulation of their lifestyle as imposed by elite sport is in itself a very therapeutic influence. So behavioral and medication therapies are part of the complex used to manage true ADHD. What of anemia? Well, this is a, a very broad topic in its own right, and, and I'm just simply raising this as an example of a condition that might bring about what we term inappropriate lethargy, fatigue. Inappropriate in the sense that this is something that is inappropriate to that individual athlete. There may be a number of different reasons for this happening, just as there are diagnostic criteria once again that need to be met. The testing of blood, serological indices such as the measurement of haemoglobin, which of course is a, is a measurement of the iron uh, binding capacity of blood, the ability for, for the red blood cells to bind with oxygen, the transportation of which is essential to um, uh, energy requirements in, in sport, put simply. The measurement of iron stores are another index of true iron deficiency, which may in itself be a consequence of poor nutritional choices, poor absorption, or a loss of iron through such uh, such things as menstruation in, in young female athletes. And the question always arises as to doctor, when should this athlete commence iron supplementation? Well, the simple answer to that is only if they fulfill the criteria of true iron deficiency anemia should you supplement an athlete with iron. That is a decision that rests with the physician and not with the coach. The condition known as infectious mononucleosis or glandular fever, infectious mono or Epstein-Barr virus, EBV infection, is another thing that's seen commonly in adolescent communities and transmitted readily within swim squads, within student populations, and it manifests itself also as fatigue, inappropriate fatigue. 
loss of appetite, uncharacteristic mood changes. It carries with it certain serological markers which we can use to determine the acuteness of the process and also the period of convalescence. And it's not until these blood parameters return to normal that the athlete can actually recover fully to be able to participate with the same vigour and accept the training loads that they were able to attain and achieve and manage prior to infection with the Epstein-Barr virus. The convalescent phase may be anything from one to two years. There may be ongoing relapses. And it's very important for coaches and athletes and their parents and other well-meaning support staff to understand that this is not something that be, can be cured instantaneously. Antibiotics are totally inappropriate. It's a viral infection and all we can do is to watch and wait and manage the athlete conservatively. On occasions there will be the requirement for secondary uh, or the use of antibiotics if there was a secondary bacterial infection because this is an immunosuppressive condition and when the immune challenge or the, the, the challenge arises to the immune system and the, the athlete is, is in a state of heavy training they're more vulnerable and as a consequence of these com combining factors it, it's important to understand that, that there is interplay and immunosuppression as part of the condition manifests more in athletes who are training very, very hard. Enough of, of, of that. I've made mention very briefly of some conditions that invoke the use of prohibited substances. And those of you that were listening to the anti-doping seminar in the room earlier will understand that therapeutic use exemption is a critical piece of the jigsaw puzzle in terms of anti-doping education but also allows athletes with legitimate clinical disease to receive appropriate treatment even though that treatment may invoke the use of a banned substance. And I think it's very important for coaches to have an understanding of the therapeutic use exemption process because so often they are part of the of the process and must often monitor the return of the athlete to sport and monitor the appropriateness of the application for therapeutic use exemption. So this in, in other terms is the medical justification for the use of banned drugs. It must comply with strict uh, guidelines as outlined by the World Anti-Doping Agency and it's available as a, a a means by which all athletes can compete on an even playing field. Why is it that a, a, an asthmatic with severe uh, asthma, a history of severe asthma, should not be able to compete? Why is it that an insulin dependent diabetic should not be able to participate in sport at a high level? The answer is of course they should be given the same right to participate and the therapeutic use exemption process allows that to happen. This is a shared responsibility. The athlete is obligated, as is the physician, to share in the responsibility for completing the necessary documentation for uh, uh, therapeutic use exemption. And if the presence of a banned substance is found in the urine of an athlete without justification, then that would constitute an anti-doping rule violation. There has been a significant amount of bad press given to therapeutic use exemption following the Rio Olympics in 2016. Many of you will be aware that the, the WADA repository of athlete information um, was illegally um, entered into and an organization calling themselves Fancy Bears uh, decoded a lot of the information held in the uh, WADA repository. Following that, it was thought that many high-profiled athletes who were, were using TUEs were 
beating the system and that this is a form of legalized cheating. That if you had a compliant physician to sign the papers, you could receive a TUE for the use of a banned substance and quite readily gain performance enhancement. But for me, the greatest test for that came when we unraveled what was happening in Rio. And the figures from the Rio Olympic and Paralympic Games were very, very interesting. Only 1.2% of athletes at the, the Rio Olympics had current therapeutic use exemption to use a banned substance. Not surprisingly, 3.4% of the Paralympians were on banned substances for medical reasons. And when, when the medalists were broken down and their clinical status was looked at, only 1% of medals were won by athletes with TUEs. So if this is truly a means to beat the system, we would have expected there to be far more therapeutic use exemption approvals in the athletes at the Olympic Games. These are figures that for the first time have been exposed and we hope will become uh, an ongoing means of monitoring the TUE process to ensure uh, an increasing robustness in, in this aspect of medical care. How FINA works with the TUE process is, is very simple but very transparent. FINA works in strict compliance with the WADA code. It has an active TUE committee comprising five physicians, each of whom have a very good understanding of aquatic sport, who are involved as sports clinicians in their own countries, and who voluntarily screen every application that FINA receives for therapeutic use exemption. To date this year, we have considered 46 applications. So we expect by the end of the year, we will have around 50 applications, which seems to have been the figure that we've received over the last few years. The one situation in which therapeutic use exemption can occur unexpectedly is in emergency treatment. And if somebody is in a situation of, for example, um, anaphylactic shock or acute asthma crisis and they need life-saving medication, of course nobody is going to wait for the approval for a TUE to administer life-saving therapy to that athlete. And in those circumstances the committee considers retrospectively these applications. So now I, I just, with that background, and I do apologise that I've, I've uh, jumped from topic to topic to, to try and give you an overall perspective, I want to raise with you a clinical scenario which is a true-to-life clinical scenario which uh, I was confronted with earlier this year. When a coach came to me talking about a 13-year-old female swimmer who was underperforming, she confessed to chronic fatigue. She had lost her appetite. She seemed to have fallen foul of regular, minor, upper respiratory tract infections. She was uncharacter uncharacteristically moody, as was evidenced by her teammates. And she described a disturbed sleep pattern. So I'm wondering, as coaches out there, because some of you may have experienced this, what you think the possible causes could be and where we go to from here. So first, would, would anyone like to, given some of the clinical conditions I've talked about, what sort of things would you consider? ADHD? Yeah, possibility, undisclosed ADHD, increased anxiety. However, she's underperforming. She's training hard and yet the results are not there. It's unlikely to be ADHD. A 13-year-old female. Pardon me, overtraining, yeah. Well, that's your fault, not my fault, isn't it? Overtraining, it could be possible that she's uh, overreached, she's uh, failing to adapt to training load.
and this is her body telling her that and telling the coach that. So let's park that one for a moment. Any other? Yes, sir. Pardon me? Mono? Yes, exactly. Mononucleosis, as I described earlier. It may be that she has contracted the Epstein-Barr virus at the last training camp she was at, and now she's manifesting those signs of infectious mononucleosis. Any other clinical conditions that might fit? Yes. Diabetes. Yes, that's an interesting one, and it is a possibility. Although at 13 years of age, it, it would be unlikely that this is the first manifestation of her diabetes, but it's not impossible, as is anything in medicine. Nothing's impossible. So we'd want to explore that. Any other slightly more common likelihoods? 13-year-old female who has just begun to menstruate. Anemia, I think I heard somebody say. Yes, anemia is something that we'd need to exclude. So already I'm pleased that you're all thinking along those lines and considering the possibilities, but the underlying requirement then is to pass them on to somebody who can help you make that determination. But let's just go back to the, the staleness over training. Um, this is a, a very likely thing and needs to be investigated and talked about and discussed with the coach. And there are, there are numerous, uh, very, very good articles written on the question of overtraining, staleness, um, by a number of authorities, including coaches, as well as physicians. But nonetheless, it's something that a coach should be mindful of. Is that overtraining complicating some other clinical problem? Is this a chronic viral infection such as mononucleosis? Is it the undisclosed anemia that somebody mentioned that hasn't been investigated? Could there be a, a heart or a lung problem? Could it be a cardiac problem that hasn't yet been identified and is only now emergent in this young female who's training hard? It would be important to exclude that as it would be to expose her to some respiratory function testing to ensure that she hasn't got some variant of bronchoconstriction or hypersensitivity in her airways, a variant of asthma? Or could there be psychosocial issues that we need to explore? And that's very, very important. Management strategies, what do you expect of me as a physician? Well, you expect me to take a very clear history and do a thorough examination. We then need to undertake specific investigations which might mean examining blood. It might mean doing specific imaging, chest x-ray. It might need an ECG and the recommendation or the oversight of a cardiologist who's experienced in sports cardiology. And at the end of these investigations in history, we come up with a working diagnosis. That's what you expect from a team doctor. That's what you expect from somebody who understands the workings of the athlete. So the role of the physician then is to provide you with some management interventions. Is this a case for medication? Is it a case for counselling? Is it a psychosocial thing? Is it involving or invoking communication with the entourage, the family? In other words, we're sharing, as I said earlier, the athlete-centred goals. Which brings us back to the point I made right at the beginning and the point that I'm using to conclude my talk. The responsibility for the care of the athlete resides with a very close coach-doctor relationship that recognises this engagement, that has respect for each other, but still allows us to work autonomously and to do our best for the athlete. Thank you. Thank you, Professor David. Just while we're on stage, any questions for, for David while we're here? No questions then. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please welcome to the stage Dr. Kevin Boyd. Good luck, Boyd.
Um, thank you very much, everybody. Um, I'd just like to reiterate some of uh, the comments that uh, David said, and I think the importance of integrating sports medicine in with a, a coaching conference like this is really important. Um, you know, we're all here to try and uh, support the athlete in, to, in terms of achieving their goals, um, and our um, uh, and our. Uh, joint workings here, I think, is, uh, is going to be really important, and long may that continue. So I, I'm, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. Um, I, I like operating on people. Um, that's what I do for a living. But if a swimmer comes to me for a surgical consideration, then I see that as a failure. It's a failure of our system in which we've been able to manage them, because we should be able to manage the majority of our athletes without the need to recourse to surgery. Similarly, we have a, uh, obtained a problem which we have not been able to prevent by some way. So I'm going to be focusing on uh, prevention of, of musculoskeletal injury, predominantly in the swimming and the open water swimming uh, community um, over the next half an hour or so. So uh, uh, my, my colleague, um, uh, Professor Gerard, did um, cover some of the core structures that we have uh, as a sports medicine committee um, have uh, in our responsibilities to uh, FINA as our international federation. These are some more of the activities uh, that we take that complement um, our work and the support that we're able to offer the athletes. Uh, and I'm going to focus a little bit on um, the injuries and illness surveillance of which as coaches, you may have some experience um, and introduce our injury prevention videos um, at the end of the uh, talk. So why, as an organization, do we feel it's important um, to uh, survey injuries? Well, if we're going to risk assess, if we're going to risk manage an event, uh, and that's obviously important in anything we do, then we need to know what the problems are. We won't need to know how important they are and, and how common they are. We also have a duty of care to our athletes, that we don't subject them to any unnecessary risks um, and that we are looking after um, uh, our athletes well. Indeed, the IOC medical code states that we should ensure that sports are practiced with a minimal of risk of physical um, injury or illness uh, or indeed psychological harm. And indeed, as an organization and as individual disciplines within FINA, we are being judged um, on these standards by the IOC. Um, and come the 2020 review project um, uh, in Tokyo uh, next year, then we need to demonstrate that we are taking these uh, aspects seriously. And when we are finding problems, we're acting to try and reduce those problems for the benefit of our athletes. Uh, Van Mechelen described this quite nicely some 30 years ago, how you go through the process of injury surveillance. And first, that's identifying the extent of the problem um, by asking the questions, how severe, how common, where is the problem occurring? And then maybe looking at some of those reasons why you might be experiencing those answers. Um, and then looking at options of how can we intervene, how can we change things. There are some things that we can't change that are unique to sport. There are other things in terms of how we train, etc., that we might be able to introduce a preventative measure. And then we go back to the beginning again. Having introduced that preventative measure, you know, have we made a difference? Has it been a positive response to the athlete? Or has there been unintended consequences that we now need to uh, consider uh, going forward. So in terms of our approach to injuries and illness within aquatics, we have to get some things right to start with. We have to agree on the definitions. We have to agree on the standards. And indeed, FINA have taken that step of agreeing a consensus, which is in the scientific literature, on how we define an injury um, and, and the exposure. Um, you know, how is the exposure measured? Clearly, if an athlete competes for one hour a week as opposed to an athlete who trains for 40 hours a week, there is a different exposure time uh, available within that. 
And probably from a coaching perspective, it's time lost that is particularly important. Sometimes there needs to be that focus on the small things, and then hopefully you'll try and prevent the bigger things from occurring. And reassuringly, in terms of our numbers, probably time lost is relatively small. It tends to be about one in five problems across the board that might be associated with time loss. And in, um, in the FINA environment, we have surveyed these at uh, World Aquatics Championships, which is one of the few times that we have all our disciplines and all our athletes together. Um, and we rely on the local organizing committee, medical teams, to provide us with some confidential information in the same way that your team physicians um, play a very important role in terms of providing uh, that information to us. And it's surprising how little overlap there is with, between uh, those two environments. Uh, the Olympic uh, movement, the IOC, run a comparable uh, process. And so our information uh, from Rio is comparable with our information uh, from Kazan 2015, for example. Obviously, the time in competition, that few weeks around your world championships is quite an unusual time for the athlete and for you. You know, that's a very different type of setting from a standard. We have, over the last two world championships, introduced a four-week recall to try and get an idea of the problems that athletes may bring into the competition rather than those new problems that are occurring within that limited window. Um, so we have been able to get some changes with time, but obviously the ideal scenario is that we know what the injury risk is in the middle of winter during hard training, um, because that may be a very different scenario than uh, what it is at the World Championships. And so ideally, we would be liking to get some information about all our athletes all through the year. Um, and indeed, that is something that is being proposed and we are working on a pilot um, where we might be able to start getting some of that all year round data from uh, uh, collaborative collaborations with national federations. But the information that you and your athletes and the team physicians have helped produce over recent years is out there in the scientific uh, domain. Uh, we have published papers from, uh, from Rome, from uh, Barcelona, um, and uh, from Kazan, which actually compared the previous three world championships. The data from Budapest is still being um, analyzed. So I've presented just a couple of graphs, and I've only looked at swimming and open water here. I assumed it would probably be more of a swimming-related audience. Um, and this shows um, injury trends with time. Um, the bottom of the graph will show the major uh, international events that we've had over recent years. You will put the able to dates with those. And on the uh, y-axis, that is percentage of athletes. Now, often when we're talking about disease and problems, we're talking by cases per 1,000 1, individuals or 1 in 10,000 individuals. These are percentages. So these are per 100 athletes. So if your team is 30 athletes high, then potentially three of those athletes might have issues of those. So again, in terms of looking at what that might tell us, you know, we might be sitting here fairly smugly saying, well, actually, the data from Rio is pretty reassuring in terms of our open water uh, and swimming fraternities, and we might optimistically think that is issue. Certainly in terms of the swimming reporting, there's no doubt that as uh, federations have become more comfortable uh, with sharing information at the times of championships, you know, the responding rate um, has gone up. And so perhaps that rising reporting line of the blue there over a number of major championships may have reflected a greater integration and collaboration in terms of reporting. Um, but if those numbers in Rio are supported, then that um, is perhaps a positive scenario for us uh, in our sport. So this is the similar graph for illnesses. The previous one was, was injuries, um, and so again, comparing the data, again, the numbers would seem to be between about 5 and 10 plus percent, uh, which may be a substantial, important number for your, for your, uh, uh, for your team. There's a bit of a blip in Barcelona. A lot of these 
uh, illnesses were recorded as um, jellyfish stings in, in the open water swimmers, where um, a third of the athletes reported jellyfish stings. Um, again, that may not have been a major contribution to underperformance, but um, it is obviously something that we need to be aware of. The advantage of coll collecting data in the same way as um, the IOC and the Olympic Games means we are able to compare ourselves within uh, other sports within the Summer Olympic movement. Um, again, you know, the numbers for swimming and open water swimming were, were good. Swimming was third from the bottom in terms of uh, injury risk. And so, as an organization, we might feel comfortable in that respect, but then we look at our other disciplines and we see that water polo was the fourth highest uh, uh, in terms of injury rates uh, at the Rio Olympics. And if I tell you that Taekwondo was fourth, uh, was third, sorry, um, and rugby sevens uh, was fifth, then that gives you a little bit of an idea of where water polo, a non-contact sport, sits within that arrangement or that, that, that sphere of collision and contact sports. In terms of illnesses, again, some of our disciplines uh, are right up there. Open water swimming was the second highest. Diving was the highest. Syn uh, artistic swimming, synchronized swimming was, was high. Again, swimming itself was in the middle of the pack. So, you know, even if we think the numbers aren't great in our own sport, then compared with some other uh, sports, then um, uh, I think there is still work to be done from that perspective. So if I then move on to talk about you know, how a sports physician might ap approach a problem, um, you know, this is our sports medicine axiom or mantra. Okay? It's not just about making a diagnosis, it's about asking some questions why. You know, so why has this athlete got this problem and why have they got it now? And as a sports physician, if we're unable to answer those problems, then we're not going to solve the problem into the long term. It's just going to be something that will come back. So we need to look at the causing, causation of sports injuries, and there are intrinsic and extrinsic uh, factors that are laid to play. The intrinsic factors are those unique uh, uh, issues related to the individual themselves, where they are in terms of their age, their development, their flexibility. These are things that can be modified, but in some respects, necessarily can't always be changed. And the extrinsic factors, particularly the training method, and perhaps training load is something that is modifiable and has a clear, significant effect on the development of overuse problems uh, within uh, aquatics. So what does that training load mean? Well, it involves the pool work. It involves the land work. Okay, um, 70 kilometer a week in my day was a relatively gentle uh, week. Um, maybe that has changed a little bit over the years. Uh, in the 90s, you know, world record holders would be swimming 120 kilometers a week. Um, so, a little bit of simple maths, you know, and you're having over a million and a quarter overhead strokes on each side every year. Um, and unfortunately, our upper limbs and our shoulders are not necessarily designed for that. You should be fairly familiar with this training cycle. Okay, we know that a training episode, whatever that is, will create a physiological response to that, and providing there is a process of remodeling that goes on and recovery, then ad adaptation occurs so that you're able to go on and perform more activity. The simplest scenario might be with a muscle. If you do some resistance training, your muscle becomes bigger and stronger. When you adapt to that, you're able to lift more weights next time. But that's relevant to every energy system and physiological process and an anat anatomical uh, structure uh, within the body. And so we do need to have this balance between the demands that are placed on the athletes uh, and the quality of the recovery. Because if we don't, then we'll end up starting having tissue breakdown and then that leads to injury. So from our injury surveillance, we've seen that overuse injuries, um, most commonly in the swimmers, um, and indeed there are similarities across many of our aquatic disciplines, you know, shoulder as the single most problem within uh, aquatic disciplines, closely followed by lower back and to a lesser extent knee. So I'm going to briefly review some aspects related to those rather than uh, necessarily talk a little uh, completely about 
how we fully manage things. But the shoulder joint complex is, is quite a complicated scenario. You know, we have an upper arm bone that moves on the shoulder blade, and the shoulder blade is suspended in some muscles on the back of the chest wall, and so it's important to have a stable and strong scapular base uh, for which the arm to, uh, to move. And indeed, the influence on the thoracic spine mobility in order to achieve the ranges of motion that we need. And so a balance of these muscles around the shoulder are particularly key, bearing in mind that the shoulder um, in aquatic sports is particularly important in terms of power and, and strength generation, whereas in many land-based sports, you know, a lot of the force will come from uh, the legs and the lower back. So in terms of joint stability, we often think about the structural things, and that's things that only people like me as a surgeon can change. Um, so we've got bones and ligaments, and in some joints, discs in the spine and uh, fibrocartilaginous uh, menisci in the knee, for example. Um, but the dynamic things, they're the muscles and the tendons that work around the joint to provide stability. Those are things that are trainable. And that's where our therapists and our strength and conditioning coaches are able to address. We know that this scenario of a flexible swimmer is quite a common finding within our groups. And so their intrinsic stability is probably more flexible and more mobile than many. And so they're a bit more dependent on the dynamic muscles and tendons to provide stability rather than relying on their own ligaments. So if we look at the published literature, then you know, it's probably more common to have a shoulder problem than it is not to have a shoulder problem. Some of the information in the literature is now a little bit historical, um, but certainly papers from the 80s were suggesting 80% you know, of a, an Olympic Games team um, uh, had shoulder problems. And this swimmer's shoulder, which doesn't really help you, it just describes that it's a shoulder problem in swimmers, you know, is probably a shoulder impingement syndrome. Um, we describe that as a mechanical irritation underneath the point of the shoulder as the arm moves through certain positions. The tendons and the structures underneath the point of the shoulder get pinched and cause discomfort and pain and ultimately loss of performance. Again, in terms of the underlying causes of these, we feel that there is a, an element of rotator cuff tendinopathy so abnormality to the rotator cuff tendons, these stabilizing muscles around the shoulder joint. We know there are influences in terms of laxity, and there's evidence in the literature about that. Again, muscle imbalances around the shoulder joint and the shoulder blade have been shown to correlate with the development of interfering shoulder pain. And obviously the biomechanics as well. If we think about this position here, demonstrated by young Mr. Hackett, is his recovery. That is a provocative position that, as clinicians, we use to try and stimulate pain. So we know that during a swimming cycle, either through the recovery or through the catch position, then athletes will be in relatively dangerous territory as, round, as far as causing discomfort underneath the point of the shoulder. Um, and so there are biomechanical types of um, aspects as well which can influence these. We know that there are some exercises that are useful in terms of prevention. They do need to focus not just on the shoulder joint, but as I said, on the shoulder blade and on the core exercises of the lower abdomen uh, and the lower back. And perhaps linked with that, trying to avoid some of those bad stretches that might stretch flexible people out even more than they need to be. Uh, and these are pictures here taken from uh, FINA's um, injury prevention uh, video, uh, which many of you will hopefully have seen. But again, the importance of core exercises in all areas, I think, uh, are, are important. So in terms of spine, we have the, you know, the mechanical building blocks uh, of the spine. That's, you know, the, uh, uh, the bony structures. They are connected by the intervertebral discs. Um, obviously, there is a, then a space for the spinal cord and the nerves to exit and travel up and down the spinal uh, canal. And then what we talk about, the posterior structures that form the arch around the back of the uh, spinal canal here that have the facet joints um, uh, at the back. Uh, 
Again, one of the more uh, uh, you know, forgotten areas is that all the bony uh, clockwork is down here at the back, and the uh, support at the front is really a muscular support uh, of the muscles lining the abdominal wall, uh, the obliques and the transversus abdominis muscle, uh, which are uh, critically important in terms of um, core stability. So just touching on that core, you know, we hear it's a term. It is really important in a lot of what we do and traditionally has been poor uh, throughout swimmers. Um, I'm pleased to say that is starting to change. Um, it's not just a six-pack, six uh, however, um, but it does provide that stability and control throughout all we do. You know, if I lean over and pick something up, if I don't stabilize my trunk, then you know, what I do with my hand and my arm is worthless. Um, and in a lot of activity, we can see that um, the forces are transferred, you know, from the big muscles of the lower back and of the legs up into the relatively smaller musculature of the arm in order to provide force. And so, muscle, so the, the forces are transferred along this kinetic chain and often in a diagonal pattern as well. Again, when we run and when we swim, we have coordinated movements of the arms and the legs in a diagonal, all right? And that does uh, swap uh, as go around. So again, all the forces will transfer through your core um, in a lot of the activities that you do. We sometimes talk about the difference in terms of flexion-related pain and extension-related pain. If we imagine in the middle, we have this neutral, well-supported, stable spine. If you then go to the extremes of movement into a flexion position, then you probably squeeze the anterior structures, uh, which are the intervertebral discs. And conversely, in the more hyperextended position, that's when the posterior elements um, end up being uh, troubled. And so in terms of our overuse back problems, there are a fair amount of issues that relate to posture. You know, the, the adolescent athlete who has the hyperextension of the knees, the big curve, in the lower back, the rounded shoulders. We've all seen them walking up and down uh, the pools over years. And so high lumbar lordosis, and so activating some of these core muscles helps straighten up that lumbar lordosis. We've touched on flexion-related pain, but a lot of what we see is extension-related pain. We know that our athletes spend a lot of the time in this hyperextended position because that's a streamlined type of position. And so there's a lot of pressure on the posterior elements around the spine, sometimes causing stress fractures of those posterior elements, the past stress fractures or the spondylolysis um, uh, as the medical uh, explanation. And so, again, we have another coin term of a butterfly back, um, which again, doesn't help you in terms of diagnosis, but it identifies that a lot of undulation, either with breaststroke um, or with butterfly, can lead to these extra pressures uh, around the back. So again, we have a series of exercises. Again, um, our colleagues in Japan have done the work where they involve putting little needles into various muscles and getting their uh, subjects to do these types of exercises. So they have identified the most productive exercises for firing your transversus abdominis, for example, or strengthening the multifidus muscles around the lower part of the back. But again, we see a very similar exercise here um, of the quadruped, okay? That was one that we saw in our shoulder exercises. So um, they are important uh, exercises across the, across the board. You will recognize many of these types of things. In terms of the knee, well, okay, we know we have big power producing muscles that cross across the knee joint, the quadriceps muscles at the back and the hamstrings muscles at the, ma uh, at the, uh, at the back, as it were. Um, there are ligaments that help stabilize it. And again, we have a little unusually the common meniscal cartilage types of things in the middle of the knee, these fibrocartilaginous rings, which sometimes can uh, uh, be injured. So again, we have another name, a breaststroker's knee that is out there in the literature. This is probably a chronic strain of the ligament over the inside of the knee. And we know that combination of flexion, external rotation, and then a valgar strain puts particular stress on that uh, inside of the knee. Um, and they can sometimes be uh, issues that are relatively hard to deal with. We know that a lot of the force from the quadriceps muscles at the front of the knee 
pass through the kneecap and the extensor mechanism, and so patellofemoral problems are very common in athletic types of problems, and we've already touched a little bit on meniscal tears, which are unusual without a, an injury in this type of population. And again, there are some knee exercises, some single knee bends, some box jumps, um, uh, and indeed, we can see again here, you know, strengthening exercises of the core and the lower back, along with those muscles of the bum, the gluteal muscles, and the hip joint are all key uh, to help with the dynamic uh, uh, movement of forces throughout the body. So I can see people have been quite actively taking pictures all along of the injuries. Now, we're reassuring you, we have put some work into this. The shoulder injury prevention video has been uh, out for around five years, and you can see that we're over 100,000 hits uh, on that, so that's positive. Um, and we have just nicely released uh, ones on the knee, the lumbar spine, and concussion. Concussion is another topic in its uh, a whole right. And unfortunately, you may struggle to see those at the moment uh, in China, because I, I understand YouTube um, doesn't tend to function here very well. Um, but we will ensure that those are put out on the FINA uh, web platform, um, and you'll be able to watch those. And they describe the extent of the problems, why it is important within your athletic population water polo players um, or swimmers um, and then take you through a series of exercises that we, have, that we know are going to be beneficial um, in terms of preventing injury uh, going forward. So if we sum up some of those injury prevention things, we're really looking at primary prevention. So this is prevention of a problem before it happens. A lot of what we do is reacting once the horse has already bolted and we're dealing with trying to prevent it from coming back. But obviously our optimum is to try and prevent it from happening in the first place. And that's what we mean by primary prevention. And so often for you know, the physiotherapists and the strength and conditioning teams, they would be able to identify postural um, uh, uh, abnormalities or muscular imbalances and be able to recommend some exercises and interventions uh, that will try and help those. We mentioned the core is important throughout. And obviously having that understanding of what the athlete needs to do for the athlete to understand why they need to do things and that everybody is reporting things um, in the same way, um, reinforcing um, through the coach um, and indeed often the parent. So in terms of prevention for coaches, then the things that you will have some direct influence over. You obviously may see that some athletes may have some biomechanical abnormalities, you know, that may be able to address. You obviously decide your training load for your athlete, but that does need to be done in a progressive fashion. It's sensible, uh, appropriate sports science approach uh, to training with those built-in periods of recovery. This is the periodization um, that you use, um, hopefully, um, all of the time. We touched on some of those external things. Again, the psychological stresses. You know, there, there are young individuals. They undertake examinations. Parents will divorce. There may be something else going on that will put on additional psychological demand above your physical demands. Often they are talented athletes. If they're a good swimmer, they may be a good rugby player, a good footballer, a good hockey player and they're often having multiple demands, and at some stage that opportunity to specialise probably is important. And again, I would like you to try and be responsive to change. Um, you may have this wonderful plan planned out for the next six months of exactly what you're going to do when and where, and that's really positive, but sometimes your athletes are individuals, and sometimes they're not able to cope with that. And you have to ask yourself, why has that happened with this athlete at this time, and what do I need to try and do that? Because if you perpetually push those athletes and stress those athletes further, then they're the ones who are going to um, fail. Nutrition is really important, and where needed, you know, access your, your sports medicine support, um, because they will be there to try and help uh, support you with that. So can you uh, prevent injury and improve performance? Well, if you have an athlete that is not injured, that means they're in the water more times. It means they're probably going to be more resilient to the forces that you have, you know, the, the, the demand that you place upon them. Um, and again, 
anecdotally, our Japanese colleagues have, in, have noted, since they've had this focus on their lumbar spine strengthening exercises, that their 15-meter start times have improved. What happens at the beginning of every race? It is a single maximum hyperextension, either on a backstroke start or a freestyle start, and they're finding that's become more effective. So it seems like it's a win-win situation for us. So in summary, um, international federations have a responsibility to the athlete and to protect them. I think injury prevention can enhance performance and should be an integral part of your programs. We do undertake injury surveillance with your help and with the help of local organizers to try and help uh, provide some information for these. And we have some injury prevention media out there in the domain, which hopefully you'll be able to take home um, and utilize. And again, as part of your sports medicine committee, you know, we are here to try and help you with your athletes and we're always available um, to take your questions and, and help as needed. So thank you very much.